Our magic carpet is bound for the highlands of central Turkey. And we will be visiting great cities like Ankara and Konya, and a marvelous region of Turkey that is unlike any other part of the earth, the region known as Cappadocia. But to get us there, let us obey the words of a man who spent most of his life in this extraordinary heartland of the great nation of Turkey. Here is an invitation spoken by a voice from the 13th century. Come, come, whoever you may be, wanderer, idolater, fire worshiper. Come, though you may have broken your vows a thousand times. Come, come yet again. Our caravan is not a caravan of despair. That beautiful invitation was written in verse by one of the most popular poets in the world today, a Sufi mystic of long ago known as Rumi. And we will be visiting his city of Konya and considering more about his life and work as we explore this world that he knew so well. We are going first to Ankara on our caravan of hope, the capital of modern Turkey. After the chaos of the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the creation of Turkey as a new state, a republic, there was a decision about which city should be its capital. Istanbul, from time out of mind, had been the great city of this part of the world, but it was the decision of Ataturk, the founder and new head of this great young nation, that there should be a capital more in the heartland of Turkey. The same impulse prevailed, for instance, in Brazil, where Brasilia, rather than Rio de Janeiro on the coast, was chosen for the capital. And so it was that Ankara, which had seemed a rather isolated spot and in Ottoman times had been used as a place of exile, became the new capital. We can get there from Istanbul with a long drive or a fairly short flight, and we will find it a city of about four million people, a bustling place, uh, with a feel not unlike Washington, D.C., filled with administrators and government officials. It's for the most part a new city. It expanded exponentially as soon as it was chosen to be the capital, but it is marked with some remarkable monuments. Let's go first to the great mausoleum of Ataturk himself, created in the late 1940s and early 1950s, a rather severe place, as fits the founder of a nation, a vast plaza, an extraordinary monument with huge columns around the central place and sculpted figures in relief. There's a little museum nearby, which I find very touching. It has among its exhibits not only the lavish gifts that were given to Ataturk by heads of state from foreign nations, but Ataturk's own personal possessions, all by contrast with the gifts, extraordinarily and touchingly simple. It may have seemed rather arbitrary to choose Ankara as the capital for this new nation, but in fact, there are signs in Ankara that it was somehow marked out to be a capital city. It is in a region of ancient capitals. Within the ambit of Ankara, the hills around it, you will find the capital cities of Hittite kings at places like Hattushash. And there among the Cyclopean masonry, the huge gates, the statues of warrior kings, rows of Hittite gods, there the Hittite kings ruled an empire. We can fortunately read their writing because early on in Hittite history they were visited by Assyrians who came to trade, but also brought with them the cuneiform system of writing. So Hittite was written down in cuneiform, and since the symbols could be read, it was possible, using the tablets dug up at these Hittite capitals near Ankara, to discover in the 19th century that the Hittite language was an Indo-European tongue, a lost ancestral language among modern Indo-European languages. They had literature, they had prayers, they had letters, you can see their homes. You can be reminded of Tyrans and Mycenae back in Greece. They're roughly contemporary, and I've always thought that the work crews, once they'd finished Hattushash, must have gotten on board ship and 
gone over to get new jobs building the cyclopean masonry of those palaces in Greece. You will find the remains, the artifacts dug up at Tatushas and the other, other Hittite sites in a fantastic museum in Ankara. It is a museum of Anatolian civilizations. And in this museum are not the Greek and Roman antiquities that are so abundant in the cities along the coast, but rather the remains of the extraordinary cultures that blossomed in the heartland of Anatolia. Now that word Anatolia means the place where the sun comes up. It is a designation for this landmass, which is also sometimes called Asia Minor, Little Asia, given by people to the west, the Greeks, looking east at the rising sun and seeing it come up over the coasts and mountains of Turkey. The Anatolian cultures go back thousands of years, and you will see among the treasures of this museum of Anatolian civilizations in Ankara, you will see the remains from an extraordinary site further south in central Turkey, a place called Çatalhöyük. Çatalhöyük goes all the way back to about 9000 BC. It was first excavated by an English archaeologist named Mellart, who noticed the twin mounds, or tells, and that's what Çatalhöyük means, a forked mound, a forked hill. In this Turkish countryside, dug into those mounds, sure that he would find something, but never dreaming that he was going to be finding one of the most early examples of a complex human society who had created for themselves a sort of hive of clay buildings in which to live. Çatalhöyük reminds me of the great Pueblo cities of the American Southwest. Not a city with a grid of streets, with public monuments and so on, but rather house and rooms set wall to wall in a vast complex. People reaching the outside world not through doors onto a street, but climbing up ladders to holes in the roof that opened onto their terraced rooftops. Among the extraordinary things that Mellart found at Chateau Huyuk was that these people had already developed an extremely complex religion and an extremely complex artistic tradition to express it. Mellart found an extraordinary figurine of a mother goddess, as he believed her to be, a powerful looking woman with great sagging breasts, a protuberant belly, perhaps she's actually pregnant, she may be giving birth, seated on a throne, and the, the arms of her throne are leopards. Here is a powerful emblem of the mistress of beasts. She was found in a grain bin, but nonetheless, when he coupled this figure with the evidence of frescoes and other art, he realized that there was a huge cult of worship for what we can only consider gods, as well as an elaborate cult of the dead. Skeletons were found under the floors, not in separate graveyards, but in with the living. Human heads had been taken and treated separately as if honored ancestors could still be present joining with the festivities, with the daily life of their descendants. Çatalhöyük itself lies 28 miles outside our second great city, Konya. And this is a city that is the uh, happy home uh, of the great poet Rumi. He was a uh, man born in Tajikistan, grew up speaking Persian, traveled westward with his family into the area known as Rum by Persians because it was the old Roman Empire. And so, ironically, his nickname, this, this great Persian mystic, just means the man from Rome or the man of Roman territory. He was trained to be a jurist, an expert on Islamic law. He uh, was uh, brought up in the Sufi tradition, and he had a life-changing experience when he met a mystic named Shams, and became his disciple and friend. This changed his life. He too became a mystic. He began to seek meaning in life that lay outside holy texts and scripture, that lay in personal inspiration. And he had a poetic gift like few others that have ever been given to mortals in this world, so strong that even today, books of his poems sell millions of copies, even in the and I mean no disrespect to the English translators, even in the weak medium of a translation. He wrote a poem about 
that lost friendship because one day, one evening I guess it was, there was a knock at the door, Shams went out, this, this beloved master, and never came back. It's still not known what happened to him. And for quite a while after that, Rumi spent his existence, spent his days searching for his lost master as far away as the city of Damascus in Syria. And yet finally he came to his senses and he recorded his thoughts in a poem, a poem that applies to many of us who go through life seeking for what we look for in another person. Why should I keep looking? He and I are one. His spirit speaks through me. I have only been seeking myself. Now the museum in Konya for Rumi is in fact his mausoleum, much like the mausoleum that we saw of Ataturk in Ankara. But it's filled with memorials of his life and his teaching. It also has a beautiful display of the musical instruments, the little flutes and pipes and three-string violins that were used in the ecstatic dances that evolved into the tradition of the whirling dervish. And this great tradition of the dance in which the spinning ultimately puts the dancer into an altered state, a religious ecstasy, goes straight back to Rumi himself. The museum at Konya is also Rumi's mausoleum, and there are words he said about dying and graves that we should remember when we are there. When we die, he said, do not look for our tomb in the earth. Seek it instead in human hearts. That mausoleum, its site was originally a rose garden owned by a wealthy man of central Turkey. When Rumi died, he allowed the mausoleum for him there as he had allowed it for Rumi's father and thus there came to be this center of reverence but also a center of study and a center where the tradition of the whirling dervishes growing out of the Sufi side of Islam is still kept strong and once a year there is a great gathering of dervishes from all over Turkey in this spot. It's in winter if you're not there on that excellent time. Uh, you will find the whirling dervishes occasionally around the country. It is always worth seeing their amazing performances, even if one is outside the circle of understanding exactly what is going on for the people doing those amazing dances. Many people are drawn to central Turkey, not for the cities and not for the his history of Islam and its literature and its dances, but rather for one of the truly extraordinary geological landscapes to be found anywhere. This is in a region called Cappadocia, or Cappadocia, as is said if you anglicize it and every C-I or T-I is pronounced sh. Cappadocia meant to the Persians in the east and the Romans in the west, land of horses. I grew up near the bluegrass region of Kentucky where the limestones are a source of calcium for the grass that grows above them and the horses grow strong bones from cropping that grass. Exactly the same thing happened in Cappadocia where horses, simply by eating the local grass, got very strong bones with an extra dose of calcium because of the minerals in the rocks below. But these were not limestones. Millions of years ago, Three big volcanoes, which you can still see in Cappadocia today with their snowy summits, they went berserk. They spewed ash, they spewed lava over this landscape. The original limestones, which were here, were covered over by up to 100 yards, 100 meters, 300 feet of ash, which gradually compacted down to a volcanic stone called Tuff. Looks very solid, but it's actually quite easy to work, as you might expect of compacted ash. But then they began to erupt flows of a heavy volcanic rock called basalt, which spread out over the surface of this soft, compacted ash. The result was a situation that looked quite stable initially. But when the rains came and began to carve gullies in the basalt, and when that that water from the summer rains froze in the hard snowy winters of the central highlands, all the water that had gone in, down into cracks in the basalt froze and expanded, breaking up that cap even further. And at last, little by little, the underlying tuff was exposed to daylight again. 
In these deep gullies, the water would now rush around and shape cones, pillars, standing masses of the tuff, but still leaving part of the basalt cap on top. The result were the famous fairy chimneys of Cappadocia. I did not come up with the name, but it is a name that tries to express the magical quality of this landscape, where these golden yellow columns and spires and cones rise up from the plain or fill valleys and often poised on the top of one of these columns, like a, an object on a pedestal, will be a block of that darker, harder stone, the basalt that flowed from the volcanoes at the end of this cataclysm that created Cappadocia. The result is a landscape that attracts geologists from all over the world, but ordinary people too, because it is of a dreamlike, extraterrestrial sort of nature. It's as if you were in a version of Monument Valley from our own American Southwest that had somehow been taken into an utter dream state of unreality. People were drawn to Cappadocia because of the high quality of the grazing ground. I mentioned the horses already, but farming of all kinds took place on this plain and in these valleys. The soil turned out to be very good for grapes. And there's in fact an industry of wine today in Cappadocia. You're able to try it yourself. Cereal crops were grown out on the plains. People flourished. It became an important province of the Roman Empire claimed by Tiberius. It developed a strong culture and lots of population centers during the early Christian period. But it was also one of those crossroads of cultures in two senses. Many different cultural influences met here, but many conquerors also coveted this rich and extraordinary part of the world or made it a thoroughfare as they moved from east to west with their hordes, with their cavalry, with their armies. People of Cappadocia found themselves in a very dangerous position. It may have been as early as the 7th or 8th century BC that a tradition began in Cappadocia of dwelling as troglodytes. That is a word that means cave dwellers. The tuff, T-U-F-F, -F, that compacted volcanic ash was so easy to dig, it could almost be excavated with a sharpened stick. Much easier to create a home by burrowing into the side of a cliff than building a home of stone out in the open. Two kinds of troglodytes emerged and developed in this Cappadocian region. Let's look first at those who are most easily matched to troglodytes elsewhere in the world. At places, for instance, such as the great Valley of Petra in Jordan. People who find a sheer face of a cliff and burrow back into it, creating a home, creating a holy place, creating a sort of human-made cave. If you want to see these communities in their perfection, you must go to two sites, Gureme and Zelva, that have been declared part of the World Heritage by UNESCO. They are also official open-air museums, preserved by the Turkish government forever to show the world this unique culture that evolved in these distant valleys of Cappadocia. Gureme and Zelva show us a late period in these troglodytic operations. They show us the Christian period, when monks, nuns, groups of people who simply wanted to have their homes in the valley but their places of worship up in the rocks would send their artisans up into these valleys, halls, dwelling places, chapels would be hollowed out of the rock and then elaborately painted with frescoes.
whole communities grew up here, slightly hidden communities of monasteries and nunneries, Christian communities. It may have begun very early on when it was still illegal to be Christian before the Emperor Constantine proclaimed that Christianity was indeed a religion that could be accepted by the Roman Empire. Some of them may have their roots way back in a pre-Christian period where the people are taking advantage of these lonely spots simply to get away from those main highways of history that are bringing so many hordes through their homeland. Whatever the case, there is a tranquility, a beauty, a spiritualism about these holy places at Gureme and Zelva where you feel a union of natural wonder and spiritual fervor that has very few equals anywhere in this world. But even more remarkable is a recent discovery. There were other troglodytes in Cappadocia who instead of going up on the cliffs, went underground. It had long been known that on some farmyards there would be a stable or a storage place below ground level. And it was also known that there were certain wells out in the countryside of Cappadocia where after letting a bucket down hundreds of feet on a rope, you would bring up fresh water. In the 20th century, people began to explore these excavations underground. And what they found astonished not just the world of historians and archaeologists, but the world at large. There were hidden cities under the landscape of Cappadocia. Almost 40 of these hidden cities have been discovered. Only a few have been opened up, excavated, explored. It's not known exactly when they began. It is clear from the material in them that they were used by Christians, hidden Christian communities. To what extent they were using the passageways, staircases, underground halls that had been carved out by earlier groups, earlier cultures and civilizations in Cappadocia, we don't know. But we do know that there is nothing else in the world that equals the complexity and the scale of these sunken cities. These cities in Cappadocia, and the, the two most famous are Derinkuyu and Kaimakla. Typically, there were round doors. Those doors are like the doors of fortresses. They are huge round millstones that are set in grooves so that people inside, having entered that circular opening, are able to release the little stone that is holding that millstone up and let it roll down into place and no battering ram in the world is going to be able to knock that in and allow access to an enemy outside on the surface. Those doorways are the evidence we use to say these are cities of refuge. These are hidden cities for people who are living in fear of something and somebody and need more than a dry, warm place to pass the winter. How many people are involved here? It's staggering, but archaeologists and historians who have worked here estimate that tens of thousands of people may have lived in individual sites among these 40 or so underground cities. The cities were built in levels. Up to eight levels have been found, and there may be many more below them. Each underground city was a warren of rooms dug into the tuff, so every wall is stone, and comprising ventilator shafts, which reach the surface and allow the fresh air continually to come in. On the surface, those shafts are in some cases very difficult to find, so it's not likely that an enemy passing through would be able to locate them or block them up. And you would also find staircases and corridors leading through the city, connecting all the rooms together. There were stables underground for the livestock. There were presses where grapes could be pressed to make the wine. There were vast storage areas where water, food, meat, cheese could be kept through a long period of time. There were individual rooms for 
people or entire families to live in. There were meeting halls, great size, underground churches, workrooms, and then places where, having burrowed straight down to the water table, the precious water could be drawn up in buckets, as from a well. And you may remember back to that shaft which went so far down that was one of the clues that there might be something underground in one of the spots where one of these cities was discovered. I recently saw a television program that argued that Dering Kuyu, in specific, was so extraordinary that nothing in this world could explain it. It must be the sign of extraterrestrials. I don't sympathize with that argument. I do sympathize with anybody who finds it difficult to wrap their minds around the idea of a community the size of a fair-sized town getting together to resolve on the concerted effort necessary to burrow into that tough, soft though it may be, and hollow out these miles of corridors. We are standing just at the beginning of the study of these underground cities. It's a problem that they're archaeologically very hard to date because although you may be able to date the artifacts that are found in them, the actual digging is not datable. And how many centuries way back into the past this strange troglodytic life may go, we still can't truly estimate. Nonetheless, they are marvelous testimony to the power of human communal effort and shared vision. They are marvelous testimony to the imagination and fortitude of these people living long ago on this high Anatolian plateau. But at the same time, they are testimony to the toughness of existence some centuries ago in this world, which today seems like such a place for meditation, for the beauties of nature, for living a very good life. If you go to Cappadocia today, you can visit these sites like Gureme and Zelva, and then go stay in a hotel which fronts on a cliff and in which your room may indeed be set back into that cliff in the same way that those troglodytes of the Christian period who dug their chambers into the sides of cliffs would have recognized very well. And those make very snug places to pass the night. No one has yet created an underground hotel. I'm not sure I would want to stay in one. But those cities are in many cases also open to visit. They're lit for certain areas along the passages. None of them are open throughout their extent. I recommend trying to find a time when they are not too crowded because the passages are narrow and claustrophobia can easily start to take over. And even though those passages are now illuminated with artificial light, it can become very quickly oppressive underground, just as it can be in a small cave uh, the feeling of the earth closing in upon you. But it's worth doing just to try to put ourselves back in the place of those whom fear had driven underground, but whose ingenuity had created such a remarkable solution to their predicament. No visit to Cappadocia is complete without a balloon ride. And I urge you to take one to have the full spiritual experience of taking in this extraordinary landscape just as eagles would do when they fly over it. The balloons mainly take off at 5 a.m. This is not a windy part of the world for the most part, but at 5 a.m. the wind is at its minimum. And there in the early dawn light you will see the balloons popping up from various sites over the Cappadocian landscape, taking a few lucky folk up into the air. The balloon captains are experts, they will work their way up into little valleys, rise up sheer cliffs so that you can get a close look into those little dwellings, and above all, take in not the human side of Cappadocia, but the natural side. Those spires and columns gleaming in the oblique rays of the morning sun, those dark caps of basalt poised seemingly miraculously on the top of tiny pedestals, landscapes that look as if they come from another world, all this can be yours for about an hour of magic. And here again, I feel that Rumi can provide us with the words to enjoy this incredible panorama. We'll end with one of his poems. I perished as a rock, 
and became a plant. I perished as plant and rose to animal. I perished as animal and I was made human. Why should I fear? When was I diminished by dying? Yet once more shall I die as a man to soar with angels. The Great Courses is a unique publisher. For more than 20 years, we produced college-level courses taught by only the most engaging professors that universities like Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, Vanderbilt, and Georgetown have to offer. We've created a university of the best. Everyone has the capacity to carry on learning. Designed in careful collaboration with our customers. Our courses are handcrafted from beginning to end for the needs of lifelong learners like you. Most publishers don't guarantee their work. We do. Every great course comes with our lifetime satisfaction guarantee. If a course is anything short of completely satisfying, you can return it for another course or for a full refund, no questions asked. The only thing left is your decision. Just say no to the dead time of car radio chatter or junk television and embark on exciting intellectual adventures with the great courses. Great learning experiences that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Visit us online at thegreatcourses.com to browse through our extensive catalog of over 350 comprehensive courses in subjects such as history, science, literature, better living, philosophy, fine arts, and more. Or give us a call at 1-800-832-2412 and speak to our knowledgeable customer care team. The Great Courses, the leader in lifelong learning.